Well, hey, before I get started today, let me give you a quick report. And I could not be more pleased or more proud of the congregation here that comes every week. Uh, and we call this campus. This is our campus. You proud of this campus? I'm proud of this campus. Between the first and second service, it looks like we're going to be able to scholarship 38 kids to be able to go. $10,000, $10,600 had come in or been pledged this morning. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. That is awesome, you guys. That is the generosity that exists here in this house is just absolutely amazing. Well, I'm excited about this message today. This is week two, if you're visiting, this is week two of a brand new series that's called What Did Jesus Say About That? Last Sunday, Pastor Luke, our senior pastor, kicked it off with a great message on what did Jesus say about life. Today, I gotta, I gotta tell you in advance that this may feel a little bit like sandpaper. Sometimes as a shepherd, and that's another term for a pastor, sometimes a shepherd in the Old Testament, and David wrote about this in Psalms 23, how the good shepherd will cause me to lie down between those beautiful green pastures, and you just kind of relax, and you kind of get a massage from the Lord, and it's just, it's just a great day, and the sun is shining. The same shepherd, though, the leader of the people, sometimes will bring them like Joshua to the edge of the Jordan River in the book of Joshua when it's at flood stage and, and the river is raging and Joshua as the shepherd in that scenario says, there it is, jump in. And I love it when I get to preach the messages. It's my favorite to preach those comforting, warm fuzzies. Here we go. We're going to have a spiritual kumbaya. We're going to give one another a great big hug. And we're going to, this is just amazing. Today is not one of those messages. And I'm saying it with, it with a smile on my face. I want to give you a warning. Warning. This is not a feel good, high five, pump you up message. This message is about death. Your death, my death, the death of yourself and myself. So I want to take you to a portion of Scripture in just a moment. But let me set it up. It's going to come out of Matthew 16. Before you put the Scripture up, let me give you the, what's happening, the thumbnail sketch, the 10,000-foot view, what's happening between Jesus and his disciples. He's walking along with them, and he starts this conversation. It appears to be spontaneous, but the Lord didn't do anything spontaneous. Everything was 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 intentional, and there was a reason behind it. Even when he would ask questions that appeared like he didn't know what he was talking about and he needed somebody to kind of fill in the blanks. Now, that's not what was happening at all. Jesus always knew the answer, but he says to his disciples, he says, hey, guys, 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 who do people say that I am? And some say, well, some people say that you're Elijah coming again. Some people think you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist had already been executed, head on a platter, the whole nine yards. And then he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter goes, oh, oh, me, 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 me. He, you are the son of the living God. And, and, and he nails it. His answer is perfect. It's textbook. It's accurate. More than just accurate, it's revelation. That's what Jesus said. He's like, Peter, good on you. Good boy. You get a gold star today because you just didn't get this kind of randomly or accidentally. You got this because you received revelation from my heavenly father about who I really am. So they go on a little bit further, and Jesus says, listen, guys, I, I, I need to prepare this for you because it's going to be tough on you. It's going to be tougher on me, but it's going to be tough on you as you see this happening. He said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and it's not going to be a pleasure cruise. It's, I'm going to suffer many things. And the same guy, Peter, now steps up again. And I love Peter because he, he, you know, he's very boisterous, and he, he's very human. I identify with Peter on so many different levels, the good, the bad, the ugly. And he's like, no way. No way, I'll protect you, not on my watch. You're not going to suffer anything. I'll, I'll show them. And Jesus now says to the same guy from the same chapter, from the earlier conversation who said, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, "Ah, a boy, that's my boy. He commends Peter there. And now he says, and it, it sounds so harsh. He's like, get behind me, Satan. He says, for you don't, you're not mindful of the things of God. You're only mindful of the things of men. And then Jesus goes into this next portion that I want to read to you today that sets up this message on self-denial. That's our subject today. What would Jesus say about self-denial? So Matthew chapter 16, 24 through 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, 
If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul? Or what will, what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his work. And in this little portion of Scripture, Jesus really lays on his disciples, of which we are among those to be counted as disciples today. Anyone who's given their life to the, to the Lord, uh, given their life over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and come into my life, forgive me of my sins, be Lord of my life. You are a disciple, I'm a disciple, anybody who has confessed Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So what he's saying to those disciples then, and he's saying to us as his disciples now, and he unpacks this, and it's a heavy, heavy subject. It's not a feel-good thing, because there are things in here that are counterintuitive to what happens in culture. Culture is all about what's in it for me. If it feels good, I'm going to do it. These things are contrary against those cultural winds. So the number one thing that I want to start with today, i got four things here today. The first thing I want to bring out to you this morning is Jesus simply identifies desire. He says, if anyone desires to come after me. And I find this incredibly encouraging and empowering and exciting because it's a level playing field for anyone. He didn't say if somebody has this kind of GPA, if somebody lives in this zip code, if somebody has reached this level level of stratus in terms of their economic impact and income and everything else, and if, they, if, they've been, if they've been this and they haven't been that, then maybe they can get into that little closed circle. He said if anyone... It's a level playing field. I heard this quote years ago. I can't remember where I read it. I can't remember the source of it. But uh, it's something I've tucked away in my memory because it's something that, that pushes my own personal buttons. He, this person had to say, we all have the equal opportunity to become unequal. I love that. I've told you about my friend before. And again, I, this guy, you got to know how to take him. He, he's European. He's from, he's from Italy. And I've had a lot of dealings. My first church in Canada, I had a large portion of my congregation from, from Yugoslavia, from, from Ukraine, and from Germany. And it was, it was a whole mix there. A lot of people immigrated there to Canada after the Second World War. And so I got very used to dealing, if you're from Europe today, I, I'm just making a general statement, but I found Europeans to be very direct and very blunt. And so my friend, at many times, he, he's an overachiever to the max, and he's deeply, deeply impacted my life. But I would always get a kick out of the people in my, in my former church, because this guy is just going 100 miles an hour all the time. And, and, and the things that he has done and the things that he's currently doing, is you, you just shake your head. But I, I, always, I still remember, I laughed out loud the first time he said this to someone. He said it repeatedly over the years. But someone would say, how do you do so much? And he would simply say in his European way, how do you do so little? Because he said, we have the same amount of time in every day. I don't have any more time than you. You don't have any more time than me. But I love this. When Jesus, when it comes to following Jesus, it's a level playing field. And he identifies, if anybody wants to come after me, the desire has to be present. Napoleon Hill said the starting point of all achievement is desire. But I'm not talking about some fleshly, carnal, human desire that's kind of manufactured or man-made. I'm talking about a godly ambition, about a godly desire, a godly driving force. David said this in Psalms 27. He said, one thing I've desired of the Lord. David identifies his desire. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus said, he answered and he said to the woman, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And it's almost like with the same measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. And while that is talking about judgment, I think generally speaking, there is a law of reciprocity in this life as you give that out. No deposit, no return. And Jesus is saying here, man, you can really determine, for better or for worse, by your desire and the presence of it or the lack of your desire and the absence of it. And in another version of the Bible, I just read what we read this morning from the New King James. I think this is how I found it in the New Living Translation. If any of you want to follow me, he makes it as simple as possible. He's like, if you want to, you can. A.W. Tozer said, we have as much of God as we actually want. So if somebody is a quarter full, that's how much of God they want. It's not like they want it to be full. No, they have set the limits on how much of God they have. If they're half, if they're a quarter, if they're three, if their cup is running over, it's because that's what 
they have wanted. And Jesus starts with this desire. If you desire this, okay, let's, let's go for it. I'm good to go. If you're good to go, we're going to go on this thing together. But the second part, here's where it gets challenging. Here's where it flies in the face of all of the cultural sensations and obsessions that are around us every day that are just trying to feed you, feed you, feed you, feed your flesh, feed your ego, feed your pride, feed whatever. Jesus said, no, we got to go a different way than that. That, What the world is doing, they're going to go down this path. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, but it's a narrow road. And on this narrow road, if you're going to follow Jesus, number two, you're going to have to deny. And that just doesn't mean say no. I almost played a clip here from uh, back in the 1970s growing up watching Hogan's Heroes. Anybody remember Hogan's Heroes and Sergeant Schultz? And he's like, I see nothing. I hear nothing. I don't know how well I'm doing right there. I sounded probably more like Hitler than Sergeant Sultz. And I'm not talking about that kind of denial, but here's what Jesus says. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. To deny oneself is not to assume some false external asceticism, but to put the interest of the kingdom first and foremost in one's life. A lot of people can quote, And they quote it with enthusiasm and with passion, but many times it it, it almost seems to be a means to an end when we quote, seek first the kingdom of God, and all of these things shall be added unto you. And we kind of of just glaze by that, seek first the kingdom of God, because here's what I really want to get to. All of these things are going to be added unto me. Bring it on. I'm ready for it. But if you're really seeking first the kingdom of God, you're going to have to deny yourself. There's no other way around it. To take up the cross is not to endure some irritating burden, but to to renounce self-centered ambitions. And I I can remember when I was graduating from college in the 80s, and the 80s was known. I'm going to have an 80s clip here in a little while longer to, to keep you not entertained, but engaged. Amen. That I, I remember the 80s because I, as the books I was reading at the time, I wasn't even following Christ. I, I had drifted. I, I was going, in the, going my own way in the opposite direction. And I read Trump, The Art of the Deal in 86 or 87. I read Odyssey by, by John Scully and everything that was happening at, at, at Apple. And it was known as the me decade. Me, 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 me. What's in it for me? If you're going to follow Christ and see the glory of the Lord in your life, in your marriage, in your relationships, in your everything, in order for that to become a reality, more than just a catchphrase or a bumper sticker, what that person needs to do, they're going to have to deny themselves, pick up their cross. And what is the cross? The cross is an instrument of death. It's just not symbolic. It's just, not, it's just not window dressing on, on our lives as followers of Christ. This is what a disciple looks like. This is the cost of the disciple, of discipleship, and the, and the cost of discipleship comes with a personalized cross with your name on it, with my name on it. A number of years ago, I can remember the two things happening simultaneously within a week of one another. And uh, I was up in Cottonwood, and I was just a brand, brand new in the ministry. I was preaching a few places, and uh, back then I was very reliant upon my notes. I have notes now, but they actually keep me on track and keep me on time, because after you've preached for so many years, I've got thousands of sermons running around in this crazy mixed-up mind of mine, and i got to know when to hit the brakes and say, get back on point. And uh, I can remember I was preaching at this outdoor rally in Cottonwood, and uh, the wind was blowing that day, and I was up there, and man, it was everything I could do to try to manage my notes as they were blowing in the wind. And then one big gust came along, and the wind took my notes away, and I'm scrambling, and it's crazy. And I put my notes back together, and I'm supposed to be on my first point, and I'm looking down, and it's the conclusion of my message, and I feel like I'm dying, like I'm a thousand deaths. Earlier that day, just prior to going uh, to preach at this, this outdoor rally, the news came on that, let, that Princess Diana had died in that tunnel in Paris as she was being chased by paparazzi. And the world mourned her death and mourned her passing. Growing up in Canada, 
because of our connection to the British Commonwealth and all of our currency is the picture of the Queen. I haven't been back. I'm going back to Canada in July, and my sister's getting married. I'm curious to see if there's any new denominations with now no longer Queen Elizabeth, but now with King Charles. So I'm curious about that. And so there's a lot of cultural connections for me historically growing up. And the world, not just Canada mourned or, 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 or anybody under the Commonwealth mourned. The, the world mourned. But a few days later, uh, Mother Teresa died. And here was this little lady. And, I mean, she was just a giant killer. She barely stood five feet tall. And yet when she walked into sacred halls and assemblies, and I'm not talking about churches or cathedrals, but I'm talking about halls of parliament and into, into presidential offices and standing before Congress and Senate and, 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 and different it, kings and queens and royalties around the world, they were in awe of this little lady who radically, in, in a way that very peop, few people ever had, had given herself over for the cause of Christ and out of the compassion of Christ to minister to the down and out, basically the lepers in Calcutta. And Mark Bontain, who was a great Canadian missionary, was overseeing that great work, and he worked very closely with her. And it was just amazing. But I can remember hearing this at a conference years ago. And I, again, many times I try to cite my sources. I can't remember the source, but I remember the statement. And one of her lasting legacies was just this simple statement. This is how she wanted to live her life, and this is, in my opinion, how she lived her life to deny him nothing. And I want that to just settle in for a second. Just think about the implications of that, to deny God nothing. I was thinking about that. I wondered if I've ever even gone 24 hours where I could actually say that after a 24-hour period. I don't think I can. Because I'm selfish, because I'm distracted, because I'm, hey, I love the Lord like you love the Lord. But to get to that place where Mother Teresa said, my life goal is this, is one thing, to deny him nothing. That, you want to talk about a disciple of Christ, you want to talk about somebody who made a difference in this world, you want to talk about somebody who brought heads of state and countries and, and governments to the point where they were paying their respect of this little lady because she denied him nothing. Number three is daily. The uh, same narrative in a different gospel. We read from Matthew in, in Luke chapter 9. Jesus just adds this one word. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Todd. Todd just wait a minute. You, you, I need you to pump the brakes here because... Are you trying to suggest to me that after I deny myself and I pick up the cross and I die to myself and I'm allowing myself to be crucified for the cause of Christ in order to bear out witness to the cause of Christ, that after I've done that, the expectation is that I do it again tomorrow or the next day or the next day or the next day? That's what? Well, don't get mad at me. Don't shoot the messenger. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. And Jesus said, if you're really going to follow me, if anybody wants to, if you really want to, come on, I'm good to go. I want you with me. Don't think, don't, don't misunderstand me. I want you to go with me all the way. Here's what this path looks like. You're going to have to deny yourself, pick up your cross every day. Every day. I think about the statement, and though it has a different context, but the words have always challenged me, where Joshua says, and if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day. And that's where he goes on a little bit further on. He said, listen, do what you want, do what you want, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's many times where I will land when I look at that scripture, and that's where I'll preach from a lot of people, and they'll have it over, they'll have it on welcome mats, and they'll have it at their homes and different things. And I'm all about that last part, as for me and my house. But it's interesting, and it, 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 it's worthy of discussion when he said, choose for yourself this day. I don't think it's just a one-time thing. That's just me. I think every day is an opportunity to choose for yourself. By the way, you can't choose for me and I can't choose for you. We can help one another. We can encourage one another. We, 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 can, we, we can be workout partners as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, it's choices that you need to make and choices that I need to make. Choose for yourself this day 
it's important that we do these things. So I'm going to use this example not to say, oh, look at me, but I'm going to use this example to try to draw out a point. So this next slide, I keep track of everything, okay? I don't know what happened to me. Somewhere in my 30s, I started to become very anal retentive in terms of keeping records and stuff. So on this next slide, go to this next slide. So this is my workout log that I enter in every day because I'm that fitness guy, especially as I'm getting older. And, uh, you know, no one has ever bested Father Time, but I'm not going into that good night quietly. I'm going to go down that age, uh, down that road of aging, kicking and screaming. So I log every day that I work out. Okay, so this is day 154 of 2023. So yesterday I logged in 6-3. I did two workouts with that too. That represents whether I did one workout or two workouts for the day. And there's a, in the last week I've done a number of two-a-days because when I had my tooth out, uh, I wasn't allowed to work out at all. They said, you know, it will cause the stitches to come out and things like that. And so I, I doubled up. So uh, in 154 days, I worked out 164 times. But I've been keeping track. And in two or three days, it'll be the one-year anniversary since I started keeping this journal. So today, in, as far as my log goes, is day 363. And in 363 t- days, I've worked out 364 times. Now, here's the point I want to make. Yesterday, I entered into my log uh, 2 at 164. But I did it before I worked out. Most of the times I enter afterwards, but I wanted it for my PowerPoint. Isn't that awful? But I want it, but you might say, well, that's cheating. You entered your workout completion when you hadn't even worked out. And I say to you, I'm okay with that. Why? Look at my track record. 364 workouts in 363 days, there's a consistency there. And what I'm saying about what Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying he's unimpressed, good for you. And and I hope that all of us at some point or another, we deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. But what Jesus really gets excited about is the consistency. And the question I want to ask you today, and the question I ask myself, when we make these claims, not just about God, but to God, is the consistency, because I, I am a huge advocate of this, without any consistency, you don't have any credibility. I won't even start talking to you about how many times throughout the years when I used to own my fitness center, how many people joined the gym saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I, when somebody says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to belabor this fitness point, but it, but it does make the point. I have a lot of people come up to me and they say, yeah, I'm running five miles a day. And, oh, man, I'm going to go this entire year. And I'll just go. Because I've, I've been doing this a long time. And I'll, I'll encourage them. I'm not going to go, you won't. You're, no, no, I don't believe it. I'll just, but I will tell you, in my experience, very few, very few follow through. Whether it's reading the Bible, whether it's about serving in ministry, whether it's, about, see, I'm so proud of this church. See all the stage? It's all, it's all cranked up for VBS that's awesome that the children's ministry doing it, but you know who's really putting it on? It's the 111 volunteers right out of this campus that are giving of their time every day this week so that the 237 kids that are registered, and that's almost a two-to-one ratio. That is fantastic, but it's the people that are showing up every day, every day to pull these things off. And in our lives, I, I wonder how many times I've said to God, God, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and God... Being God says, way to go, Todd. I, I, I'm with you, but I wonder how many times God is actually saying, I don't think he's going to do it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he said those things before. And we need to have consistency in our lives. Can somebody say amen? amen. Okay, so now fasten your seatbelts. I'm about to enter my, uh, introduce my next point with the most powerful tool possible. Point number four is drive. Who's gonna tell you when it 
Okay, Michael, cut it off, because if you keep playing it, I won't even think to finish the rest of my sermon. Amen. How many people uh, were raised on the radio? You grew up listening to the radio. Then in the 80s, if, if you go a little bit, you know, I was born in 64. I'll be 59 in a couple of weeks. I was raised on the radio. But in the 1980s, when MTV came along, oh, buddy. You got to see those videos. You got to see those artists. You got to see those things. And I can remember when the Cars uh, came out. It, it was a phenomenal a- album. They had so many hits off this album. They had Hello or Hello Again. They had, uh, they had You Might Think It's Crazy. They had Magic. They had Heartbeat City. And they had Drive. And uh, I always liked this tune. And later on in the late 80s, early 90s, I took a radio broadcasting course. And the, the, a lot of cars were in the mix of when I was going in. They, a lot of people think, by the way, I'm just going to do the Wizard of Oz and pull back the curtain. A lot of people think when they call in for a special request. Now, you're given a selection by which you can get your request. At least we did it. K100 FM radio in St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. Cars, and I always liked this, and, and so I've been waiting for years and years and years to work that song into a message, and today is that day. I did it. I did it. I, I'm complete. I, it's like the last sign in the book of Revelation. It's there in the Bible Code by Grant Jeffries. If Todd Matchett can work the song by the Cars into a message, he that's it. You're going to hear the midnight cry. But here's why I put it in there today. Same scripture that we used earlier, but in the message, it says this. Matthew 16, 24, in the message, it says, Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. He says, Anyone who attends to come after me has to let me lead. And then he says, You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me, and I'll show you how... Look at this. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but to lose yourself? What could you ever trade for your soul? But the main thing here that jumps out at me, Jesus says, you think you're in the driver's seat? You're going to be my disciple? Okay, you got to be prepared to change positions if you're really going to come after me. If you want to come after me, you're going to have to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily and come after me. And this version says, here's what you got to know. You can't drive. I mean, and I love driving. I mean, I got my license uh, almost 59 years ago. I got my license on the day that I turned 16. It was a Tuesday. That Friday night, I uh, took a girl out on a date. Her name was Janet. And, I mean, I got my license on a Tuesday. Took this Janet out on a Friday. Got pulled over by the cops that same Friday night. Hallelujah. And not a lot has changed since then. Amen. But I like driving. You know, I just, I like driving. My family will tell you, when we go on family trips, we don't fly. Probably drives them nuts, but I we will we'll drive. We will if we're taking a crew. We'll, we'll drive. When we lived in Indiana, we would drive from Indiana down to Fort Lauderdale. We lived in Canada. We drove from Canada down to Fort Lauderdale. I mean, we're 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 that family. I like to drive. Here's the deal. Jesus is saying, if you're going to be my disciple, you got to be willing. And some of you are going to have to use your imagination. We put this as best as possible. We were going to get some ramps, and it just didn't come through. So you're going to have to go with me. But Jesus is saying, if you're behind the the wheel, but you want to be in my will, you got to get out of the driver's seat. Let Jesus, in the name of Carrie Underwood, Jesus take the wheel. Okay, and you say, well, that's that's cool. I, I, I can dig that. Jesus, you take the wheel. And for those in the cheap seats, I'm in the passenger seat. 
Okay, can you see me? I'm in the passenger seat. Now, this particular vehicle doesn't have a back seat. And uh, I do think there are a lot of people that try to be backseat drivers even when Jesus is driving. But ultimately, if, if Jesus is going to take the wheel, and you've got to go with me on your imagination here, here's what happens. You're not in the driver's seat. You're not in the passenger seat. You're not in the back seat. This is intended to be my trunk. Okay? Ouch. <laughs> so what happens is that if you're truly going to go after God, truly go after God, not just for all that he has, but all, all that he is, ultimately... God will say, okay, I, I got the wheel. You want to be in my will? You want to be in my will? I've got to take the wheel, but you're not in any of those other seats. You basically get out. You climb into the trunk. Then you hand Jesus the key, and you are content to ride in the trunk to wherever he takes you. That's the cost of discipleship. That's the cost of dynamic living. This is Mother Teresa saying with her life to deny him nothing. I feel when I pop out of here, I'm coming out of a cake. <laughs> like a magic trick. Ta-da! Hey, that's, that's the best we could do today. Amen. So go ahead and stand with me at this time. And uh, we have keys here for everyone. And when you get your key later, just don't put it on your ring and don't give it any thought. Mark it up somehow. Etch something into it. Color it. Do something. Because <laughs> my memory's so bad. I got keys on my ring. I'm like, I wonder what that's for. I have no clue. Don't do that with this key because let this key serve as a reminder to say, Jesus, take the wheel. I want to be all that you've called me to be. And I recognize in order for that to happen, I need to surrender the, the wheel. I need to surrender some of these other places that so many other people are unwilling to give up. They got to be, it's like, Jesus, take the wheel. But I'm, I'm shotgun. I'm riding shotgun. Jesus like, no, you're not. Get in the trunk. Get in the trunk. And what's, what's that involved? It involves trust. It involves faith. It involves an intimacy of relationship that God, I don't even know. You would think that after all these years of preaching the gospel and, and professionally speaking, being Pastor Todd, I would know. I don't know. There's times, and sometimes I get, I get ticked off. I'm past. Do you know who I am? I'm Pastor Todd. I've preached over 3,000 messages. And the Lord's like, get in the trunk, bozo. We're going, we're going somewhere. And I'm like, yeah, but I've earned the right to know in advance. No, you haven't. You pick up your cross daily. You die to yourself daily. I've got the desire. The question is, do I have the decisions and the determination and the discipline to say here's my life take it to deny you nothing it cost him everything to deny him nothing will cost you the same you will either die to self or you will sit on the shelf you can't have it both ways and for those that feel like life is just passing them by and even the things that God intended for them that are just passing them by, could it be that in some of those cases they are sitting on the shelf because of their unwillingness to die to themselves? So let's take our communion at this time. Does anybody else need some emblems? We have Ted and Pam and 
others that are going up and down the aisles. I think the ultimate illustration for this is not this gator with a cardboard box and me climbing in the back. The ultimate real-life illustration is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, if there's any way, if there's any way, this cup can pass from me. Oh, that would be great. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Let's remember the broken body of Christ this morning. And ultimately, when we talk about a cross, it's, it's a metaphor. It's a type and a shadow of uh, difficult choices and difficult circumstances and denying ourselves. Jesus, it wasn't a metaphor. It wasn't just intended for dramatic effect to try to illustrate something. Jesus was nailed to the cross. And on that cross, he shed his blood and gave his life for you and for me. Let's remember the shared blood of Christ. Heavenly Father, this morning, I pray. It's a, it's a heavy subject. It's a difficult topic. But it produces life. Sometimes what we fail to see is that when we look for shortcuts and the easy way out, those things, uh, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but it leads to death, but it's not the kind of death that you intend in this, in this story. It, it's the death of marriages. It's the death of relationships. It's the death of things that you would want to thrive and live and flourish. But God, if we would deny ourselves and die to ourselves, Lord, what could happen in our hearts and our homes, our families? What could happen in this world when instead of just demanding our own way, that we would deny ourselves and see a bigger picture, when we would see the example of Christ? Help us, Lord. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not even saying that I'm faithful in doing it, but I want to be more faithful at just giving you the keys. And I believe, oh God, when we give you the keys, it unlocks this life as you intended. Help us, Lord, to be found, if need be, in the trunk. We ask this, Jesus, and everyone said, amen. So I've got your key, couple things. Just stick with me for a moment. So I've got your keys all up here. Number two, if you made a pledge for the kids today and you want to pay today, Renee's going to be in the foyer with the little square. Buy up the rest of the breakfast burritos because we have to clean them up if you don't buy them. Amen. And if anybody wants prayer, Ted and Pam and some of the prayer team will be across the front waiting for you to agree with you, to pray with you, and it'll be a powerful time. I'll be back at that door to shake your hands. God bless you. We'll see you all later. Amen.